some speakers, and I think um, we at least have a quorum. <laughs> um, good afternoon. My name is Clayton Lane. I'm the CEO of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, ITDP, uh, based in New York with teams around the world working on sustainable mobility. I'll be our moderator for today. Um, I would like to introduce our panel, um, but if you would, uh, bear with me. I think we'll do that next. I'll start actually by, by framing our discussion together today, uh, the discussion on shifting personal mobility. Uh, and then I'll, I'll introduce our, our esteemed panelists and we'll have a fun interactive discussion. Thank you all so much for being here as well, um, after lunch as well. So we'll try to keep the energy up. I'm sure we'll have no trouble because it's a great topic. Um, so just to start, I wanted to remind us where we are. Uh, we know this chart, but let's still remind ourselves, this is the temperature variation in the world over the past century versus the average. You can see the reds to the right. Uh, that there is 2015. That's 2016. And that's 2017. So we're already approaching one degree warming versus the century average. Uh, we are already in a changed world. So clearly the issue is very urgent. Transport comprises about 28% of global GHGs from fossil fuel combustion. It is the fastest growing sector of GHGs as well. Uh, so quite an important topic for us to, to tackle together at the conference. Now I think there, there's two big challenges that I think are affecting our sector and help frame our discussion. One is rapid urbanization, uh, the fastest, most dramatic change in human lifestyles in the history of humanity as we move to cities. And how those cities are shaped and formed and built uh, around transport uh, will drive GHG emissions dramatically. This is an example here from Toronto, three neighborhoods. This is a suburban neighborhood uh, where the average GHG emissions per capita is about 13 tons. Um, then we move into the city and it's about half as much. Single family homes near downtown Toronto. And in the downtown core, just a fraction, one-tenth as much, 1 1.3 um, tons per, per person. And I think this highlights just how the shape and form of cities around transport matters so much. Um, in the dense, compact core with mixed uses and walkable neighborhoods, uh, that, that neighborhood requires less energy for heating and cooling um, yeah, because the interior spaces are smaller, less energy required for urban mobility because distances are shorter and more easily can be covered with, with walking, cycling, and public transit, even less energy for water because there's less landscaping uh, required. So dramatic differences. That's about urbanization and, and the form in which we live. I think the other big pattern we're seeing or revolution is in technology. And we've seen several technology revolutions in the world historically. For example, streetcars completely transforming the shape of cities. Automobiles clearly, once again, uh, limited access highways along with that. Moving forward, we see three big technological revolutions. Um, automation, electrification, and shared mobility. These also will transform mobility in many ways that are not yet well known. And, uh, we endeavored with UC Davis actually to, uh, to try to estimate what would be the impacts of these. Um, and it's important to, to highlight that we get to choose the future we want. It's not just about predicting the future. Um, because by default, these technologies are neither positive nor negative. Here's, you've seen this image before many times, right? Space required to transport 60 people in cars. And there's the same 60 people in Ubers. And there's the same 60 people in autonomous cars. So we very much need the policies within cities to ensure that these new technologies can be enabled in such a way that we, can get, that we get much better efficiency from our transport system. Um, a few organizations came together and actually developed a set of uh, principles for cities uh, as guidance. I won't go into these here, but it's just to say that there is a movement underway to, de to develop what these principles should be. I want to finally just give you a few uh, looks into a more technical look at the same topic of where technologies and uh, compact cities could lead us. It's some research that we did with UC Davis called Three Revolutions, again focused on those technologies. Um, and we found that if we really can combine the best of all worlds, and that means compact development along with high quality public transit, walking and cycling, we 
the world could dramatically reduce the emissions from uh, transport in urban areas by over 80%, according to our estimates, uh, with very detailed modeling. And what's really interesting, too, is the bottom half of this slide, that this actually costs less, not more, that a massive investment in public transit, walking, cycling, um, and good shared mobility, along with electrification, actually cost less because we need less infrastructure, cities are more compact, um, there's also less cost for fuel and for vehicles, and this does not even account for the cost savings of other types of infrastructure, like water and sewage and electricity. So I think I'll actually pause there, though I have many really cool, interesting charts I could show you, um, and, and just leave it at that and skip sort of past these beautiful charts right to, um, to this here. Um, you know, our thesis here in conclusion is that we really need an integrated approach. We need what we would call a three R scenario, three revolutions, all of the above technologies plus compact developments, uh, the sharing, uh, the public transport, high quality walking and cycling, fair user fees, electrification along with a clean grid. It's all of these together that can reduce the risk of global warming the most. No one solution is sufficient on its own. We really must pursue all of these together um, to best um, address the risks that we, fa that we face. Okay, so let's get on to our session here. This is about shifting personal mobility. There is a separate session at the COP today that's really about electrification and technology. Um, I'll introduce our speakers, our panelists for us here. Let me just scroll down in my own notes. Um, and Bronwyn, please join us as well um, on the stage. I'll actually introduce you first. Thank you. Um, so joining us on the stage right now is Bronwyn Thornton. Um, uh, Brownwin is the development director for Walk 21. Thanks for joining us. Um, she's an international expert, facilitator, and trainer on walking and walkable communities. And she works with communities and professionals around the world to promote walking <coughs> and to develop and deliver innovative, practical projects. Thank you for joining us, Brownwin, and giving us your global perspective. Um, next, I'll, uh, it's in, in the order of my notes. I'm sorry, not in the order on the stage, but Gunnar, if you could just... Say hello, great. Uh, so Gunnar Hype is the head of strategy and planning for Munich's public transport company called MVG. It's a, a German name, I'll leave it at that, MVG. Um, uh, Gunnar has been uh, the director of, of planning uh, projects uh, for this company. Uh, he's responsible for all development of metro, bus, tram, as well as the development of the company's multimodal and fully integrated uh, approach to mobility in Munich. Uh, Gunnar is an active member of the German Association of Public Transport and appointed member of the German Academy of Urban and Regional Planning. Uh, and for UITP, he is the chairman of the Commission on Sustainable Development. Thank you very much, Gunnar, for joining us. Um, next, uh, we have um, other practitioners as well. Uh, Pex Langenberg. Pex, uh, say hello. Good. Uh, the vice mayor of Rotterdam, uh, Mr. Langenberg, uh, is the Vice Mayor of Port, Sustainability, Mobility, and Governance for the City of Rotterdam. Previously, he was Director of the Water and International Water Program Department of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, next, we have uh, Pierre Cern of, uh, of Mobilize Your City Partnership. Pierre, thank you for joining us. Uh, Pierre is the former Vice President in charge of transport for the Paris region. Uh, and he's still an active member of the Paris Regional Council. So we look forward to your wisdom from a city nearby. And finally, we have the mayor of Quito, yes, uh, who joined us also and, and helped host us in Quito uh, at Habitat 3 just a year ago. And I remember you shared very passionately in that meeting about uh, the great progress that Quito was making at the time. So we're eager to hear more about that and also the progress since then. Okay, I've asked our panelists here to each begin for five minutes, just to introduce themselves, and more importantly, their work. Tell us about what's been happening successfully in their part of our field of sustainable transport. Then we will move to a few questions and questions with the audience. Um, and I'd like to actually ask, um, ask Brownwin to start, uh, sort of to frame things more broadly, and then we'll get to more of the practitioners. So if you could come up here for us, please. Can I go up there? Yes, you can, please. Thank you. Apologies for my rather dashed arrival. Um, so yes, I uh, uh, work with Walk21, 
and I know some of you will know who we are now, uh, but we are a small uh, but dedicated team of people that have been promoting and supporting walking since the year 2000. 21, yes, 21st century, uh, and we have certainly seen a renaissance in walking uh, since uh, the first Walk 21 conference in London in the year 2000. And I think the evolution of walking um, is reflected in what's happened since, since that time. I mean, there is no evolution in walking. The evolution happened in that we all now stand up and walk every day. But what happened in the mid-1900s was motorised travel came along and walking started to drift away from the attention that it needed in <coughs> our cities. And the mass motorisation of transport has resulted in a neglect of our essential mode of movement, which is walking. So it's really great to see not only Walk 21 now saying walking really matters, but ITDP saying walking really matters, having done so much good work around other modes of transport. And, uh, and this conference and all the conferences that we attend, walking is now expected rather than, oh, surprise, we're going to talk uh, about walking. So we're really pleased uh, documents like the Global Mobility Report has, has appropriately captured uh, walking and the contribution that it can make. And it's very important for the transport and climate agenda. We work a lot across different disciplines around urban planning, around health, around tourism, around children's movement to school. And it's in the transport arena that it's taken longest to get traction for walking as, as a topical issue. The health agenda has been pushing for it for a very long time. World Health Organization, uh, we were consulting with them earlier this year. They've written a global action plan for physical activity. And it is just everyday walking that matters for our general health, maintaining our metabolisms and the health of our bodies. We all know now that sitting is the new smoking and we should all be standing up very much uh, more, but it's just movement in our everyday. But how do we get everyday walking into our communities? And uh, the uh, international community did this, uh, the health community again has been very forward on the agenda on this. They surveyed, four, led by Jim Salas, um, and the Coalition for Active, uh, Active Living. And they surveyed 14 cities around the world to find out what makes a difference for walking. And there's critically three things. We need density. So we have been building obesogenic, we've been building walking out of our communities by sprawl. So we have to look at ways of building density. We have to build connectivity and we have to give people somewhere to walk. If you have density, connectivity, and destinations, then you have walking by default. People don't actually have to think, oh, I better walk, health tells me it's a good idea, climate tells me it's a good idea, I don't really want to, but I should. Instead, what happens is people go, I need to go shopping, and actually walking's the most effective way to make that happen. And so you bring those elements together in the way we design our cities. And so when you look at that with our transport sectors, and we're moving now to a really good partnership with public transport because to underpin the financial viability of public transport and to increase its attractiveness and its appeal and also enhance its GHG emissions, we need more walking to stations. So MTR in Hong Kong and also in Sweden, the Washington metro system, tr public transport operators, TransLink in Vancouver, are realising that if they invest in walkability around their stations, then they are going to see increases in ridership, which in means increases in revenue, and therefore their contribution to GHG emissions and quality of life in our communities can expand. So for walking, it's obvious to us. It's as obvious as putting one foot in front of the other and keeping going, but we'd forgotten that it's actually our right to walk, it's our right to enjoy it, and it's our right for our children to be able to move safely and securely, independently, in our communities, and that's what walking offers and uh, the activity levels that you get, you combine walking with cycling into an active mobility umbrella or add in public transport. I don't like these nouns or these titles that group things in, so non-motorised transport. Please don't call me non-motorised <laughs> transport because if we are active transport, then motorised transport is passive transport. If you call us non all the time, you're already building us out of the picture. And also, I'm not sure that I want to be a vulnerable pedestrian anymore. Hmm. I'd rather talk about the dangerous contributors to our road environment. So let's talk about dangerous road users and 
very important, valuable uh, pedestrians. So it's about changing the language, it's about changing our perspective and remembering that we as people start with walking, our cities and our transport systems need to do the same. And it's really exciting to see A, walking on this agenda and all of the other global health um, and urban planning agendas. And I look forward to sharing with you what we launched this morning, which was our Global Sidewalk Challenge, which was about continuing to do that through building the spaces for people to walk safely and enabling them and inviting them to enjoy their communities on foot. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you, Bronwyn. Great. Um, so we're going to move from big picture uh, progressively to uh, practice. And so I'd like to ask um, Pierre to join us next, also for your perspective on Mobilize Your City. Hi. Is it working? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, and um, actually I will, at this stage, speak on behalf of uh, Mobilize Your City Partnership, uh, which I'm a board member, and not in, at this stage in perspective of uh, what I did in Paris region, but I, I'm sure we'll come back on that later. Uh, you actually reminded us uh, clearly uh, how huge and growing is the part of your urban transportation in emission, <coughs> and also the crucial role played by cities in fighting um, against climate change. So actually, Mobilize Your City uh, is um, a, a partnership uh, plan uh, to encourage, uh, to promote um, planning sustainable urban mobility in global south cities. Um, the idea was like kind of the, s the first thoughts were like made in Lima, COP20. Actually, the initiative wa was launched in Paris, COP21. It became an international transport initiative under the UN Marrakesh partnership last year. And actually, we are now like uh, getting on, <coughs> on tracks for, uh, for the really developing our uh, uh, partnership. Um, the idea is to help cooperation between uh, northern and south, uh, southern cities. Uh, the in initiative, the partnership, is a multi-donor action jointly co-financed by EU Commission, France and Germany, uh, several institutions in, in the European Commission, the French uh, government and the German government, and uh, more and more partners now and funders. Uh, the objective of Mobilize Your Cities, uh, Mobilize Your City, is to have 20 countries involved on national level to develop uh, sustainable urban mobility policies at national level, and at the end of the partnership, we aim at 100 cities. Uh, engaged in reducing their emission by 50% uh, through the development of sustainable urban mobility plans, um, So the partnership is working. We get, uh, we, we gather donors and we, uh, with these funds, uh, assist and help uh, beneficiary partners that we select and uh, to shape urbanization and transport development in a, in a sustainable and climate-friendly manner. Um, we already have uh, nine countries uh, involved and more than 30 cities uh, now. We actually will uh, and if we'll, uh, get on board a few mem new members I during this COP. Actually, Quito will on Tuesday be uh, joining the, the partnership. Uh, and uh, we, for uh, as far as now, we already have uh, pilot countries and cities in Cameroon, Tunisia, Morocco, Senegal, India, Dominican Republic, and we will go more and more all over all over the world. Uh, and in 2018, so more countries and cities will be involved, and projects uh, will keep going on, and uh, we will develop also uh, a knowledge exchange platform. Uh, and a uh, lot of training also for uh, 
city stakeholders and, and, uh, and uh, our partner. Uh, the main idea that, uh, that is like, the, the idea is to say, if we invest like for example uh, 1 million euros, um, it will be much more effective if we invest them in southern cities than in northern cities right now, if we look at the effect, the, the, the concrete effect and climate change. And the idea is so to get more and more funders uh, to convey these funds, not only in northern cities where there's a lot, lot of uh, uh, project and maybe we'll come back later on what we did in Paris, but with the same amount of money, what the impact is so much bigger uh, if we achieve the same thing in southern cities where actually the growth of population is bigger and the, 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 the growth of uh, uh, transportation, urban transportation is also have the more and more impacts on, on, uh, on climate. And uh, maybe I will end on that is also uh, we are like really considering the fact that some small investments, like not, not only on big urban uh, infrastructures, but on small investment, on planning. Creating a, a sustainable urban mobility plan is a few hundred thousand euros. And it has great impact and great effect rapidly on the way uh, public transport or urban mobility is shaping toward a more um, climate friendly uh, thing. And also the fact, and I, I'd like to come back on that later, but uh, the fact that more and more um, it's in, in the, the head of a, a city stakeholder that small or smaller investment, for example, uh, on uh, active modes, yeah. on cycling, uh, costs so much uh, less than a big metro or even tramway infrastructure and can have a lot, a huge effect on uh, the, the reducing our ecological impact and uh, our climate impact. And this is also one of our goal is to convey that and, and try to think, sometimes thinking small have bigger effect than uh, thinking big and as a better like global uh, action toward not only transportation, but also what city looks like and, and what cities look like and, and also how they impact or not on climate change. Excellent. Thank Very good. Thank you. I'm impressed also with how Mobilize Your City really takes a, a holistic approach to a city's plans and then links that to finance to really try to move uh, real projects forward toward that plan. Excellent. Well, let's move now to... I actually forgot to huh? say that you also will be IPDT. I, I yes. CDP will also join like... Uh, uh, today. The Later today. And today <laughs> is the end of her, so yes. Yes, and uh, we're, we're very honored to be part of it. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like now to move to our two mayors. Um, and especially, let's start with, uh, with uh, the mayor of Quito. You just mentioned the importance of, uh, of the global south and really getting things right. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, if you would, about uh, the latest progress in your city. Of course. Please. <coughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's uh, an honor to be here. Yes, uh, as it was said, uh, we hosted Habitat 3 last year in Quito, and it was the opportunity to discuss very relevant issues regarding the role of cities on the new urban agenda and uh, how to implement and finance the actions that we need to deliver in order to uh, have a, a greater progress in the path towards urban sustainable development. Uh, let's talk first about what I was asked. The the um, situation in Quito, how's our uh, mobility scheme constructed, and what, what are the actions that we are undertaking in order to fight against climate change. Our mobility system is responsible for 56% of our CO2 emissions. Therefore, it is obviously the main issue that we should address in order to fight against climate change. What we are doing is we are building an integrated mobility scheme 
that takes into consideration many different ways of mobilizing people. First of all, we are building right now the first line of metro in the city and in the country. And it's a very interesting example of uh, coordination within uh, not only a national um, perspective, but also international. Um, this project is being financed by four different multilateral organizations, and uh, a part of it is financed by the national government, and most of it, around 70%, is financed by our municipality, which is actually a very interesting example because uh, the Metro of Quito is one of the metros with most municipal funding in all of Latin America, which also is a big challenge, but it's a challenge that we should undertake because of the importance of this uh, project. The idea is that uh, the metro will uh, mobilize around 400,000 people per day, and it will become the main access of our public transportation system. And that public transportation system is also comprised by five BRT corridors, and also we are building right now the first cable car line as a massive tr uh, public transportation means, which is uh, something very interesting because Quito is in the middle of the mountains. It's a very high city. It's uh, 2,800 2, meters above the sea level. So we have a lot of neighborhoods in the middle of the mountains. So in order to reach them in an effective way, uh, the cable car line system is a, is a very um, positive tool in order to get to those places in a clean, fast, and cheap way. Mm -hmm. um, also, we are expanding our bike line uh, system throughout the city, and we uh, introduced last year uh, electric bikes, um, because since we are in the middle of the mountains, uh, you know, having electric bikes is a very interesting way to stimulate y the use of bikes in people that normally wouldn't do so because of physical reasons. Um, also, we are expanding our network of pedestrian lines, uh, particularly in the historical district, which is a very big historic <laughs> district and um, a particularly beautiful one that I um, suggest you to get uh, to visit. Um, so, so these are the vision that we are pursuing, uh, including all the different elements of an integrated, holistic uh, perspective for mobility in order to effectively fight against climate change. Now, let me talk about some specific ideas that we are just developing uh, within the different networks of mayors. Around a month ago, um, within the umbrella of the Global Covenant of Mayors, ICLE, C40, and others, um, 12 cities, including Quito, uh, subscribed a pledge, a clean transportation pledge. Uh, through which we will get to the year 2025 buying only zero emissions buses for our cities. And the idea is, of course, to have more and more cities adding to this pledge in the near future. But besides that, Quito, Quito uh, decided uh, an additional uh, pledge to implement, and is the one to get to the year 2020 having clean public transportation in our historical district. Um, I think this has a very symbolic and powerful effect, particularly in Latin America. For most of Latin American cities, our historical districts are like our living room. It has a very emotional effect on people. So I think that by defining a relatively small amount of land, of territory, to have clean public transportation is something relatively easy, cheap, and very, very effective in terms of sending a message that we can actually have some areas of our cities uh, with clean, zero emissions public transportation. And the other, uh, the other good effect of this is that you it's something really manageable. Mayors can actually decide how many blocks, how many you know, hectares, of, of, of land within your historical district will be part of this initiative. It's something that is replicable and is scalable mm -hmm. and is concrete. I think that if there's one um, very positive uh, feature that we as mayors have is the possibility of do things concrete and very fast with, with clear, clear and visible effects. So uh, in this regard, 
we are just launching a call for action for, for local governments throughout the world to jump in in the initiative of um, having or, or delivering a more concrete and um, starring role for local governments in the NDC's agenda, and particularly in the designing of investment plans for local governments' policies on climate change. Um, along with uh, the mayor of Buenos Aires, we will present this call for action during the Macron summit in December. And the idea is to present uh, a clear scheme on how local governments can have easier access to finance climate change actions. I think that's the biggest challenge that we have, mm -hmm. how to access finance, how to access finance <coughs> within our national environments, within the multilateral uh, scheme, and also how to better access finance through public-private partnerships. So the idea is to launch this call for action uh, next December in order to make progress until the G20 summit in Buenos Aires next year. That will be the great opportunity to have everyone together, national governments, multilateral institutions, private sector and local governments in order to propose the idea on how to um, allow local governments uh, the uh, easier ways to finance their uh, climate change actions. So to sum up, I would say that our biggest challenges are first, be concrete, be effective, deliver policies and projects that could be replicable and scalable in order to fight against climate change. Second, how to better access finance from the local government perspective. And third, how can we build uh, alliances that would enable us to actually achieve those goals, how to be uh, much more effective on climate change actions considering the main role that cities play in that regard. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Inspirational examples from Quito and also um, the new initiatives, especially around uh, delivering a concrete role for local governments in the NDC sounds really exciting. Something I hope we can return to today. Very good. Um, well, let's move on then. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Pax uh, Langenberg, the Vice Mayor of Rotterdam, please, uh, to tell us your experience. Yes. Thank you. Guten Tag. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think you are all uh, experts in this field, so I decided to mention a few um, uh, kind of uh, projects and initiatives we are doing in Rotterdam uh, in order to get a discussion going. Please ask all your questions uh, if you want me to elaborate on a few of these items. And I also uh, tried to put climate uh, policies, climate adaptation together with uh, transportation. Um, and especially I think that climate change is of course a big challenge for all our cities in the world uh, and it's important to overcome those challenges, um, especially also for Rotterdam. Two thirds of our country, the Netherlands, is prone to flooding. Uh, so Rotterdam is lying under the sea level. Um, we have of course uh, already felt all these consequences of climate change. Think about uh, uh, flooding, uh, higher temperatures in summer, uh, and all kind of these things. So we all, we, we both try to work on mitigation and <coughs> on adaptation. And in adaptation, Rotterdam addresses the question how to prepare and to deal with the effects of climate change. So as I said, increasing flooding risk, intensive rainfall, climate change, um, uh, higher drought, higher temperatures, drought, so there are many levels we have to work on, um, both on the local level as on the regional, national level, where we have our protection system, dikes and levees against the seawater. But more and more, we have to be careful uh, because rising water is also on the rivers. And we are at the end of a delta, so three rivers are coming in the end in the North Sea, following or mostly through Rotterdam. We absolutely feel committed to work with the Paris Agreement, COP21, um, and in order to become a real nice <coughs> resilient city in the near future. 
Our adaptation measures are quite diverse. We, for example, create more water storage capacity in the city and we slow down the drainage of rainwater. Multifunctional use of spaces in the city uh, is a starting point for Rotterdam as reflected in examples like our underground water storage uh, which is combined with a parking garage in the city center. And we also have water storage facilities on top of a large parking garage uh, which is of course another, another level. And also the multifunctional roofs program to create more storage capa capacity for water on rooftops combined with other functions like for example solar panels. And the results are less overflow of sewer water to canals and less flooding of streets. And last but not least, building on the riverbanks. I mentioned it already, even on water is a focus in Rotterdam. This requires unlocking these areas for inhabitants with transport facilities on water, waterborne transport, so to speak. So my message to other cities in the world, working also in this climate, in this background, is uh, be aware of these risks, be aware, assess the risk very carefully and change your mobility assets and networks. And the effects of, of shock like flooding on mobility and the assets itself can be immense. Think about again, New York City, Hurricane Sandy, the metro system in Manhattan couldn't be used for weeks because of the flooding of the metro tunnels. Or Houston more recently, the Hurricane Harvey, thousands of cars were demolished by floods and the mobility in the city was hampered. As part of the climate mitigation program, Rotterdam stimulates the use of zero emission transport. The main focus is, of course, on e-mobility and gets reflected, for example, in our charging networks. At this moment, we have 2,000 points of charging in the city itself for uh, all kinds of cars also within the, uh, the areas where people live. E-mobility e is not only the answer for climate changes, but it also creates a more healthy environment, and especially air quality is in this respect very important. We'll talk about that later. Together with uh, our logistical partners, taxi companies and so on, we work on an uptake of the use of zero emission vehicles. Some vehicles get uh, more privileges if they uh, enter the city center in order to visit the shops to deliver goods. If they work with uh, e-vehicles, they get some privileges. Uh, for th and the other thing is that we have, since a year or two, uh, an environmental zones like so many more cities in Europe, uh, which really worked um, in that way that we could create more cleaner air by forbidding a, a kind of cars which are very old, especially diesel cars before 15 years and older. They are really bad um, because of their root and hydroxygen they are emitting uh, and by um, uh, preventing them to enter the, cities, the city center, we already reached a very great improvement of our air quality. And also, you know, in the Netherlands, we are using a lot of bikes. We are born with bikes uh, and we always try to create a bike-friendly environment with many measures like parking garages for bikes, uh, more dedicated bike, bike lanes. And the newest thing is that we grant more pr privilege and more priority for bikes with traffic lights. And last but not least, public transportation, transit, we prefer to have it on electric or hydrogen, that all um, helps enormously for the, uh, the environment and of course the air quality. So to sum up, stimulate bike and public transportation is important, have a cohesive regional and urban network, public transportation and car use should be in balance. For example, parking outside of your city is the best of course and then try to stimulate with a nice price that people use to park their cars there and follow their journey into the downtown area by public transportation. Secondly, an attractive and a vibrant inner city with strengthening of the what we call the city lounge, so priority for pedestrians, for bikes, less cars on the streets, more parking in garages, which means more space for kids to to play on the streets. Third, strengthening new innovative demand-driven modes that connect to larger urban and regional uh, public transportation connections like waterborne transport 
and other schemes like car sharing, but also bike, bar, bike sharing. Um, priority, of course, for buses with traffic lights. And last, and more efforts on a healthy and clean environment and zero emission with smart technological mobility innovations, clean logistics, trucks get privileges if they deliver their goods in a city center, they are allowed to drive on bus lanes, for example, um, or to drive another times in a day. Uh, stimulate electrical trans transit, as I said, and the use of e-buses and e-cars. Public transportation, uh, important, of course, to, if to prevent that people will use the car for the short distances. We think uh, distances still about seven kilometers could be done by bike or by public transportation, but that means that the frequency and the quality of public transportation has to improve. In the end, 24 times per hour, uh, the metro connections everywhere uh, and also train connections from the regional side should be 12 times per hour to can just step in. So as I said, it is a uh, 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 sample of our initiatives we are taking and I'm mm -hmm. very happy to elaborate later on on specific items you want to know more about. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Once again, I'd say inspirational and um, very importantly, early on, how you connected to uh, the issues of adaptation and, re and resilience to transport and using the example of New York, uh, which was so dramatically affected. Um, I understand now that Rotterdam is also advising other cities how to do things better. Um, but you're also making great uh, example of, uh, of a holistic, balanced approach to sustainable mobility. So very inspiring. Very good. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to invite uh, Gunnar Heip uh, from Munich to tell us about his experience uh, in public transport there. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk something about the uh, international experience that UATP, as the International Public Transport Union, uh, did in the last years uh, in beforehand of, of this COP and since uh, 2014 and later on maybe during the discussion you can ask me some of the questions uh, towards, towards the, the Munich experience. I think, first of all, everything here on the COP around PPMC and the Marrakesh partnership is, is very nice because 10 years ago, almost nobody was talking about mobility and transport at the Climate Change Summit. I think that was really changed. And I'm going to tell you in a few words what uh, the public transport sector declared in 2014 at the UN Climate Summit um, to be credible and uh, to explain what the uh, members of the UATP worldwide uh, in all continents are going to do and have been doing already to take real action on the ground and to scale up ambitions. If you want to have examples, you have heard from Quito and Rotterdam just examples where members uh, of uh, city companies and public transportation are doing there, and I'm more framing maybe on the, on the overall initiative. To get the credibility and the support for the transport sector on uh, climate-friendly transportation in 2014, we launched the so-called um, Agenda uh, UITP Declaration on Climate Leadership. So we wanted that the members who are really doing action on the ground on cities level, public transportation organizations, authorities, industry members, and public transport operators, sometimes even broadly mobility providers, they show and they show their best practice and they commit to the aims and the goals that the cities um, are committing and that the countries are committing lately then in the Paris Agreement. So already in 2014, uh, 300 pledges from 110 members worldwide in reducing about 25% of CO2 emissions even in the clean public transport sector were committed and half of them is already now fulfilled. So we are really um, challenging the members to follow up with these actions and that was one of the reasons why we got in very good um, debates together with the UN agencies and with many other partners uh, here in the room to say this is real action, this is really going to happen and this is also politically viable because you see it also on the ground, it's real action that politicians can explain to their citizens. I think also lastly very important is that we were looking at very different things. Uh, the mayor of Kiti was talking about scalable action, so the different 
members of EITP, they have been committing to very small actions, which are maybe more on the behavioral side, but which can change also dramatically the carbon footprint of mobility in cities, always with the backbone of public transport, putting people in boxes together, making it more compact, uh, over more technical measures, improving the footprint of the public transport system or the overall mobility system as a whole, and then, let's say, more overarching uh, larger measures which also need then large funding and where it was already said uh, the the funding community and the mobility community and cities maybe still have to work even closer together in the future. So this was uh, very concrete and I think in that way um, the public transport sector is really very open and will continue to con contribute to that and walk, uh, work together with mayors around, with the finance sector and with all the other stakeholders and uh, Lastly, I could just say it was a really brilliant entrance here in the uh, talking about walking because if you use public transport normally the most healthy effect of using public transport is walking. So having walkable cities, I think we have all the same slogan. Uh, we need that and we are working hard also on getting these benefits together. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. So um, we have just a few minutes for a group discussion here. Uh, and I thought we'd try to keep it a bit, uh, a bit focused. Um, but one theme that a couple of you mentioned was about finance. And I wanted to ask you, even if you did not speak about it uh, on this topic, um, what are key ways in which we can increase and catalyze finance for the very tangible projects that you all have spoken about today in cities? And I wonder if you could share for us um, not only wisdom, but perhaps an example um, that supports that. Anyone? Please, I, oh no, I, yes. I, yeah. I, I think it's always um, the easiest, of course, if you have a, a, a solid governance structure and a, a long-term vision, and then you can plan on the long-term vision of a city as a whole, mm -hmm. of course, a financing structure. In Germany, there's national papers that, that are called like transport finances transport, but inside the whole transport sector. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, we are very jealous to places that have uh, city tolls and others like Oslo and Stockholm and Singapore and others who have a long-term perspective, then they have a solid funding and then public transport and the other uh, infrastructures are, are really financed over a long time at local level, not being dependent on, on national funds or others. Um, if, if you don't have that, I think one thing we were uh, a little bit successful in, in small scale, even in a city where everybody would say, okay, in Munich you have money anyway, um, is just re really individual negotiations. Mm -hmm. and, and what we did in the last years was getting very, very much in negotiation with the real estate sector, um, who kn that knows very well nowadays that public transport is a main enabler to gain more profits from real estate. And even without a formal framework, uh, we just got to some examples where they contributed a number of millions in, in just voluntarily contributions, mm -hmm. uh, even in the maintenance of the one or other station. Um, architecture co uh, competitions even together for new stations, uh, for a new tramway line in, in a part. So I think the real estate sector is something which is very interesting mm -hmm. and where you have the co-benefits and, and that's something I would advise to everyone. Absolutely. That's uh, fascinating. Uh, please, um, Vice Mayor Rodovan. Yeah. <coughs> um, I fully agree with what our Munich colleague said. Um, especially for those countries where you do not have that much taxation on local level, we are really depending on funding of central, federal level, national level, regional level, especially for public transportation, uh, and especially in these dense populated areas with big cities. I think the federal government still has a big cons responsibility to help the local and regional government with funding um, all these. Mobil mobility is so important for economic growth, which means it makes it a national importance issue mm -hmm. also for the federal government to, uh, to keep on funding mm -hmm. for this. Uh, secondly, I think uh, you were mentioning the toll system. It's also a quite cultural and very debatable idea. Um, everyone who was in university uh, learning about transportation policies, I did not, but I heard about it, uh, is that the only thing which really works to get people from their own car into uh, public transportation or on the bike is to make the use of uh, the car more expensive. And then, so tolls will help, of course. Also, I think parking fees 
and there is a system which we use in Rotterdam where parking at the outskirts of the city is much, much more cheaper, mm. uh, guaranteed, if you use the uh, public transportation after it, and parking downtown, there you pay the biggest price. Mm. So in this way, you also try to, to make it more uh, and uh, to make it more affordable for people to use public transportation instead. Yeah. It, rem it reminds me too of my own team's work in Mexico City on, on parking policy recently, where the city converted the parking ma minimums, requiring developers to build abundant cheap parking into maximums. And as the developers approach those maximums, they have to start paying fees that go into a fund to subsidize public transport yep. and affordable housing. So yep. I think that's really interesting. And th the real estate example is fascinating as well. Brownen, you have a, a thought, yes? I had a very short thought. Uh, what we find with walking, the greatest way to uh, liberate funding is political will. Mm -hmm. There is often the, the, the cost for building walking or the political decisions to open streets for pedestrians or to change the design guidelines so that when investments in streets are done, they require proper investment for pedestrians. So there's lots of places the money can come from, um, but it's the political decision to make the investment that is critical at this junction for walking. You're right. There does seem to be finance for roads, so why not for proper footpaths, right? Yeah, and there's quite a lot of money for roads, and walking doesn't need nearly as much. So it is it is a matter of actually allocation rather than creation, yeah. uh, that decision. Mayor Espinel, please. Yes, um, I think that um, there's actually an opportunity to, to access to finance <coughs> while you are developing infrastructure projects. Um, you just mentioned the, the, the real estate example, which is really interesting. And link all this scheme with a climate change perspective. Mm -hmm. um, let, me, let me go right to the point. Since we are building right now our subway line, we developed new policies for the areas around the um, subway stations in order to stimulate eco-efficient uh, building criteria. So, for example, uh, you can buy air rights in the areas immediately near uh, subway stations as long as you fulfill uh, eco-efficient criteria in terms of water, energy saving, and also providing for public space uh, within the premises of the building. Mm -hmm. And that's linked closely with our long-term urban development design mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. under a climate change action perspective. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, we in these buildings, we are promoting not a minimum but a maximum number of parking lots mm -hmm. because what we are trying to stimulate is the use of public transportation or uh, walkable mm -hmm. areas, right? And that's why we're building the subway line, that's why we are, we are expanding up our pedestrian areas, etc. So I think that putting up all together the idea of uh, public transportation infrastructure or as a whole the mobility uh, the, the mobility infrastructure uh, under sustainable uh, criteria plus uh, the developing of a long-term um, urban designing uh, scheme under the climate change perspective with ways to finance all those mm -hmm. by putting up the right kind of incentives to the population. Mm -hmm. A fascinating example where, where you're saying that in part the public investment is used to then leverage exactly. private investments exactly. toward eco-friendly solutions. Uh, Pierre, please. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, to link finance and, and planning because I, I talk about a lot about planning like uh, sustainable mobilities, uh, all investment and financing of public transportation or mobility really has to be uh, part of a really plan planned uh, on, on many years and, and a very integrated planning. And I, I will take two examples, one good and one bad in Paris region. The good one is that in Paris region for a long time, we have uh, only one integrated uh, uh, local uh, authority for public transportation for the whole region, 12 million inhabitants, one uh, public transportation authority mm -hmm. integrated for all the modes modes and this uh, allows us to have like even if we have very rich part of the region and very poor part of the region the richest part of France 
are in our region and the poorest part of France are also in the region. Mm -hmm. And if it was only that uh, the, the, the cities or even counties that were like investing on public transportation, then you would have like huge like uh, subway, very dense and nice and clean mm -hmm. uh, public transportation in some zone. And other zone, you would have nothing. And the fact that everyone is putting the money inside one box and everyone is participating to the finance of public transportation, um, it's a kind of a complex mechanism, but the richest the city or the part of the region is, the, 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 the more money you put in the, in the box. And then it's reallocated, n not uh, if you are rich or not, but for the needs of the inhabitants where they are. So it's a kind of, we call it pair equation, and it really works. I mean, there's a nine billion uh, euros budget every year, and it's actually allocated where it's needed and not where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes hard, like some mayors, uh, some like uh, politicians say, but I give 300 millions and I only get this. So mm -hmm. it's, there's sometimes a kind of a Thatcher reflex, like uh, I want my money back. <laughs> but globally, it's still going with the per equation. So this is the good part. But the other part that is, I think, not done really well uh, all the time is that so, uh, when you plan your investment, y you, you, of course you, you have objectives and then you allocate the money for this objective. And then you should always think how many people will be effect affected by the euros or the dollars that I, I invest, how many people and how clean it will be or not. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are decisions that some one of, us, uh, of, of them just been taken in Paris is that we're going to have the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. so we need a fast express train from the airport to the center of Paris. Mm -hmm. This train will cost 1.7 billion euros wow. and will actually be, on the good days, used by maximum 15,000 people wow. a day. Wow. On the same track, there's a suburb trains, mm -hmm. train uh, that is desperately needing like something like 500, 000, uh, billion, uh, 500 million euros to be reshaped and is actually used by 1 million <laughs> suburban oh. every day. Okay. So that's not the 500 million for this train used by 1 million people every day, oh. but we're going to put 1.7 billion mm -hmm. on a train that will be used by businessmen or people coming to the Olympic Games and maybe not even the 15,000 because probably there will be 5,000 because the mm -hmm. ticket will be more than 25, Euro, mm -hmm. more than 25 euros per, per, per uh, uh, rotation. Yeah. So this is typically something that has not was not planned in our like, uh, sustainable urban mobility plan. Mm -hmm. It was not in, in it. It's a decision taken by the national level mm -hmm. and the money that is allocated to that would have been so much more needed mm -hmm. for mm -hmm more clean and effective uh, investment. So wow. you see, even in a region with a, a, a sus sustainable yeah. urban mobility plan for a long time, sometimes decisions are really wrong. Another, another key example about priorities, I would say. Um, we have just a few minutes, and I want to make sure we move to our audience. So I'd like to ask you in the audience if you have any questions of our panelists to please ask them. We'll take a few questions and just spend a, a few minutes on those. Uh, I see there's three microphones, so uh, whoever uh, is interested, please um, ask a question. Please, yep, if you're near a mic, go for it. Hello, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I'm Ipek Gensu, a researcher from the Overseas Development Institute. I wanted to ask the mayors about um, thinking about transforming to more... Um, um, I don't want to use the word non-motorized, human-based <laughs> uh, <laughs> transport systems and low-carbon transport systems and the different stages of development. So we know that the Netherlands probably started doing this a lot earlier, um, but then other cities where there's already um, extensive motorized transport um, systems in place and roads and what some of the interventions can be um, at the different stages of, of development um, to make sure that we transition to low carbon. Thank Great. You. 
Uh, next, please. Thank you. Bernard Hensing from the European Cyclist Federation and the World Cycling Alliance. A question to the Mayor of Quito. Uh, you talked about investments, of course, integral in, in more sustainable uh, transport, but you mentioned also electric assisted bicycles. But what is your policy on cycling in general? Because uh, electric assisted bicycle is, is, is one part, but what is about the other uh, bicycles in, in your policy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, a third question, perhaps? Someone interested? Okay. So we have the question on um, on the interventions at various stages of development. Oh, please, yes, if you would. Uh, then the question on cycling, the cycling policy. Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, I want to ask about, uh, do you uh, uh, concentrate on a project for transport, uh, whatever adaptation or mitigation, but I want to ask about the beautiful project between waste and energy and transport. Is it allowable in uh, your programs, uh, which you already done? And uh, for the GIZ, I want to ask about uh, if you have uh, a part, uh, uh, have a difference between the mega city and the middle city for uh, planning. Do you have such a mutual uh, uh, mutual planning for uh, transfer transfer experience between middle city and the middle city and mega city and mega city? Do you have such a program? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So let's take those questions, uh, interventions at various stages, uh, the cycling policy in Quito. Uh, waste to energy to transport. Um, I welcome any of you, but I wonder if Pax may especially have some ideas there. And then uh, the transfer of experience between cities. So we'll just take a few minutes. Please don't answer all the questions, <laughs> but <laughs> what you find interesting and most relevant uh, to answer. Please. Well, um, our bike policy. Of course, we also have regular bikes, public bikes. Um, uh, regular bikes and electric bikes are all free for citizens. So it, that's a way to stimulate the use of them. Uh, the reason why we introduced electric bikes is because we realized that since we, again, are in the middle of the mountains, we have very still, uh, steep streets all over the, the city, many people didn't use the bike because it's, it's really hard to do it, as opposed to, for example, the Netherlands, that it's all flat. <laughs> We have a huge challenge because of that. <coughs> so by introducing the, the electric bike uh, idea and concept, what we are trying to do is to stimulate the use of bikes in general, right? To, to show how enjoyable it is to ride a bike in a city, even though it has steep uh, streets. And, and actually, that's a goal that we are fulfilling, and we are also of course, expanding our number of uh, bike lines, uh, kilometers. We are, uh, again, uh, promoting the idea of, of, of um, you know, how healthy and enjoyable uh, riding a bike in Quito could be, even though it might be challenging on, um, physically. But uh, in order to expand the number of users, uh, having electric bikes have been very useful. And of course, electric bikes are only, I mean, Electric bike stations are only located in those areas of the city where we have more uh, steep streets than others. Mm -hmm. Alex, please. Yep. Yes. <coughs> um, the second question was about waste energy transport. Um, I'm not sure whether I understood the question properly, but what I can tell you about is what uh, we in, in Rotterdam and most other cities in the Netherlands of course, try to, uh, to to have the zero emission transport as much as possible. And if you talk about public transportation, it's really a challenge because uh, many of these options of electric buses and hydrogen buses are much, much more uh, expensive than the ordinary buses. So there always should be a balance. And if we work together as concession uh, governments uh, for a new bus concession for the next 10 or 15 years, uh, it's very good to work together uh, and as the governments together so we can make a more uh, the, to, to challenge the market to deliver more quicker those zero emission, emission bus buses and also uh, a much cheaper. That's important. Um, our 
public transportation, if it goes uh, about uh, metro or tram, we use uh, green electricity. Uh, this is already a step, of course, and of course we like electric vehicles uh, much more better than the buses. And talking about the diesel, there is a lot of development of the diesel now, diesel Euro 6. Uh, for the experts, they, uh, there is much better um, environment um, effort than uh, before. So with all these kind of uh, examples, we try to get into a little bit more of the zero emission more climate-friendly public transportation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, please, Bronwyn. Um, just before I came to join the panel, I was having a conversation with a mayor from Zimbabwe. And his question to me was, all of this talk is of high-tech solutions. They're not always suitable for our communities, for our cities. And how do we leapfrog all the mistakes that you've made that we are now trying to, that you are now trying to uh, correct or, or address. So we were having one of these transitions. What is the transitions? How do, how do we move forward? And um, I, I, I take a lead from the, the sign here, which is about shifting personal mobility. And in many cities around the world, we don't need to shift it because they are already walking. They are already choosing. You don't have to use non-motorized. You just call us zero carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are, these modes are already there. So let's not keep punishing people for choosing, or they're not choosing these modes, but punishing for having to walk by not giving them the safe facilities. And look at retaining the energy that already exists in these cities with the but by giving them the appropriate facilities, um, safe, comfortable, attractive, to uh, enable them to continue to choose to walk and not prioritise uh, the quality in, in the motorised mm. uh, systems. And, and I take as an example, um, I hope they don't mind, uh, the city of Budapest. They got a lot of European money and they adopted the Transport for London approach to their city. Lots of boroughs, a centralised transport authority, lots of money to do lots of new public transport. That city already had 35% of people walking. Mm -hmm. And I said to the new Mr. TFL of Budapest, I said, so what are you doing for walking in case if you're picking up this TFL model? And it wasn't even on the agenda. He said, well, oh, no, 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 we're doing buses and trams and, and everything else. So, so, so my message is let's not shift the people who don't need shifting. Mm. Let's reward them and restore the services and, and that they warrant so that as we move forward, let's do the basics first. Let's respect their human rights and, their, and, and their, they, the, the facilities that they deserve and then add everything else uh, on top of that. It is an excellent reminder. Thank you. And Gunnar? Yeah. Maybe just to the transport and, and waste and energy, uh, just two ideas. I don't know if that really answers precisely your, your question. Uh, what, what we're doing in the, in the transport companies that, of course, everything we're going to purchase is going to be recyclable. We're looking for the energy footprint. We're doing an energy management system for both environmental reasons and, of course, economic um, output. Uh, both on the vehicle side, that is now 60% uh, less than, than years ago in consumption, uh, the training of the drivers, um, and then of course recycling both the waste of the passengers, which is in a big city an enormous amount of waste, uh, and, and then of course also the waste that the company produces by making infrastructure, recycling, uh, infrastructure and those things. But I think to remind uh, where that all came from, I mean in, in Germany in the early 80s and just the green movement, it came really from citizens. And I rem remember myself at school then when we wanted to start recycling at school. So and then it later on it became political mainstream and then it became legislation and so on. And nowadays we have pricing schemes. In Munich you pay more if you produce more waste in your house. So you must measure it. Um, and in Munich it is, is fantastic because the people are uh, world champions in recycling, so we pay every year less money for our waste because there's more and more recycling in compost and glass and so on. So I think even on the general waste thing, you have to put an economic case on it where you pay the price that it really costs and that's, uh, that's then a very strong mode and then the citizens themselves, they can trigger on that and influence that even more. Excellent, good. And Pierre, yes? Yeah. Two short answers to two questions. Uh, you ask about big cities and not that big cities, so I don't know where you put the <laughs> the, the scale. But what I can say is, uh, in Mobilize Your City partnership that I talked uh, 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 before, 
uh, the limit, the, 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 the lower limit is 100,000 inhabitants, which is a medium or a, even a small city in comparison with some of our cities are m millions of inhabitants. So it goes from very, very big cities to smaller cities. And of course, we try to make cooperation between same level and same problems, uh, cities in North and, and, and South. So yes, there's also exchange and possibilities for smaller cities than just big metropole. And secondly, on biking and, and bicycle, um, I don't know if it's like that uh, much an example, but I was really struck by the fact that last week we had the conference uh, uh, of Kodatu, which is uh, uh, an NGO that was uh, the one of the founding partners of uh, Mobilize Your City, and we had a conference in Hyderabad in, uh, in India. And the uh, vice president of India delivered a, uh, an opening speech. And we were really ready to hear about all the huge infrastructure, metro, a train that they are building everywhere in India. He actually talked to us uh, for 15 minutes about bicycle. <laughs> and the fact that bicycle, biking, was probably one of the best solutions for urban India, for, for the cities in India, knowing that uh, they are like running after like uh, infra they create infrastructure, huge infrastructure, and it's already too late, too too s small for the, the 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 number of inhabitants, where bikes can fulfill the demand of everyone. And it was like really, really, we were. I was really pleased, but I was like really surprised to hear that from the vice president of India. Yeah. So I think bicycle and biking is getting more and more global, and a, a real like uh, fundamental solution uh, for every cities and every in inhabitant all over the planet and for climate change I think it's a really good thing not only for climate change yeah. but also it's 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 a it's very encouraging and in the smart cities program in mm. India now walking and cycling is much more prominent on the agenda than just a few years ago yeah. so I'm gonna close for us here but um, while I do I'm gonna ask you to think about your closing statement of 15 seconds which is the one key piece of wisdom, the one takeaway you want to make mm. sure you emphasize that people remember after this session today. I'll give you a moment to think about that while I summarize everything else that you've said for the past <coughs> hour. Okay, <laughs> so you have your moment. Um, I think there were so many really interesting ideas shared today. It's, it's impossible to really capture them all in a summary, but I think there were maybe three key themes that I heard that I thought were really uh, important. The first, I think, was the importance of local action. We have heard again and again from practitioners, from mayors, uh, from networks on the stage today, uh, just inspirational examples of transformative change happening in cities. Um, uh, in Quito, the first metro, the five uh, bus rapid transit systems, um, Mobilize Your City also taking a more holistic approach now uh, helping cities, uh, all of the advancements in Rotterdam around bicycling and so on. Um, second, I think, is this theme around the holistic uh, integrated approach. There was nobody here today who said, there is a sil silver bullet, I have it, and we've done it. What you actually heard was a wide variety of solutions, a package, if you will, of really trying to pull every lever possible. Um, it was inspirational when Pex, I think, talked with us about um, the work on, on eco-mobility and uh, zero emission zones in the city and uh, bicycling and bicycle garages and lanes and traffic priority for bicycles and so on, uh, really quite a bit. Or Brownwin, when you talk to us about how sitting is now the new smoking, what, what an accurate and different way of thinking about it um, that is so true and how walking needs to be a core part of a holistic approach to sustainable mobility in cities. And I think a third um, theme that we heard today was about finance. Of course, I did ask that question, but we got a lot, a lot of very interesting ideas that I, I want to make sure we capture there. Um, Mary Espinel first uh, spoke about the importance of, of including cities in the NDCs as eligible recipients of financing. And I wish we could have talked more about that today. That is a key idea um, that we should definitely talk about more. Um, Gunnar, the, uh, the example about uh, partnering with real estate companies to really leverage their investments, or as you were saying, Mayor Espinel, also um, getting the private developers to contribute in response to public um, investments. Um, 
text I think you were saying also, you're re, re um, affirming the importance of federal or national financing to provide that steady stream of cash flow that enables cities to plan uh, with more confidence. Uh, Bronwyn, the idea of just prioritizing finance for the right things. Like some of this is really simple. Just prioritize uh, the right things. And of course, Pierre, the whole example about the reallocation of finance within the Paris metro region, often for very good ends to help the poor, but sometimes with some political missteps. So uh, just a variety of, I think, <laughs> great wisdom on financing as well. So once again, the importance of local action and of replicable, scalable solutions uh, the holistic approach to sustainable mobility, and the importance of finance, both traditional and innovative approaches. And now that you've had two minutes to think, I will ask you from my right to my left to share with us your 15 seconds takeaway for today. Mayor Espino. Um, I think that as local governments, we have a great advantage by being concrete and being effective on an everyday basis. So we have to take advantage of that feature in order to deliver replicable as and scalable projects in, ter in terms of climate change and fighting for having a more active role in the international arena discussion. Excellent. Good night. The information is already there and you have many people uh, here on the conference and worldwide that you can exchange with. So I would say number one is look at UITP.org. Mm -hmm. That's where all the public transport sector has its know-how, its exchange platform. Then look at SLOWCAT, the SLOWCAT Foundation for Low Carbon Transport. There you have all on another level information on the whole uh, sustainable mobility sector. And if you want a, a glimpse on some very concrete issues which are easy to copy, and integrate all modes of transportation, then look at our app, MVG More, then you can see something very easy that you can do. Pierre? Yeah, I, if I have to summarize everything, uh, if you have one euro to spend on urban mobility, really think how many people will be impacted and how effective it will be on, on environment and socially also speaking. And knowing that, obviously, investing this money m more in southern cities now than in the northern mm. uh, part of the world. And then y for this, you can use mobili Mobilize Your City uh, partnership to uh, give the money and allocate it to the right place and the, the on the right policies. Excellent. Pax. Well, <coughs> taking into account uh, the huge amount of CO2 emissions caused by transport and transportation, we really think we all should work uh, on these challenges and I think the solution is what we heard today is a comprehensive urban policy, sustainable, which means that will bring, uh, I think, happy people in happy streets. Excellent. And Bronwyn. It's very hard being last. <laughs> 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 Such good things. Um, at Walk 21 we say people on foot are the indicator species for the quality of life in your cities. and walking has such an important contribution to make to clean air and uh, happiness of our people. It, let's not forget it in the rush to solve all these problems, but let's foreground it as the beginning of the solutions. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you.